for, I mean, I'm in my mid forties. Like I'm definitely not in the position, even though I'm doing well, where I could buy a $5,000, you know, table or make that level of gift to an organization, but I got friends, you know, and I can yes. you know, bring them in. So just bring all of that stuff of like breaking it down into like very tangible goals that feel achievable. All right, everybody, welcome to the Dia Bondi Show, a big podcast for folks with goals. I'm Dia Bondi, longtime leadership communications coach and catalyst and creator project Ask Like an Auctioneer, where I help you ask for more and get it so you can accelerate yourself and your goals and your dreams, get more of what you need so you can get where you want to go faster. I am so happy to be here today with Baby A, my on air co host, my on air producer, and my on air bestie. Hi, Baby A. Hey, Dia. So before we jumped, before we pressed record, we started talking about your purple pants. That's right. Well, it started because I'm wearing gray today instead of black, which is one of the only other colors that I wear these days. And then, but you, then I called you out. Yeah. Yes. I have purple pants. They're really great. They fit really well, but they have a hole in them that I need to fix, and I have not worn them in a while because they're sitting in the mend pile. Uh-huh. You know? Do you have a big mend uh, pile? Do you have a big mm, mend pile? Not really. Maybe a few pairs of pants. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like the I like a certain type of Levi's, and sometimes they get a little rip in the crotch, and right. so they need to be. Okay, uh, wait, sewn. but your purple pants, which I have seen you wear multiple times, yeah, with a black jean jacket, which I think is kind of the look that you do with those pants. Is that yeah, not sure. right? Mm-hmm. See, I'm I'm with you. I'm tracking. Yeah. So those pants, though, are not nece- They're not Levi. They don't, Levi they didn't are. make a. They made a purple jean. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, is, it called, um, is it called the Baby A? That's what they should call that style, the Baby A. I, you know, I don't think it exists anymore. It's just a random pair that I found at a Ross one time. All right. Well, when I go thrifting, if I find, you know, if I, you just got to, you should text me one day. Yeah. The, um, you know, the model number and size. And, you know, if I'm thrifting one day and I see a pair of purple Baby A Levi's in the right number code. They're all yours. I will spend the seven dollars on you. Yeah, I will. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Purple's my favorite color, but I mostly just wear black and gray because I'm so sick of picking out colors to wear. There it is. Just keep it simple, man. Just like keep yeah. it. Just do the Steve's Jobs where it's like black turtleneck all the time. L- lower that. Yeah. Lower that cognitive load. Exactly. So today I had some stuff I was going to talk about. Right. Because we always oh, yeah. do that. And and I went for my walk this morning with the dog. And I ended up changing my mind. Oh. So I was listening to this podcast. And on it was uh, a guy named Rory Vaden, who is a co-founder of the Brand Builders Group. And he and his organization hired a research group to do a research around influence. He's talk- he talks about personal brand, but um, around influence. Like what influences people's decisions to trust and like and you know eventually buy from you what are the benefits of a you know of a personal brand that's not why I was listening to this segment of it instead what was stood out for me were the results you know that they that they got from this piece of research and it basically there were like five things that matter to audiences and influence whether they want to say yes or no to you about whatever you're selling or whatever you're doing or whatever job you're applying for etc Um, And that was that the number one deciding factor in whether people would uh, buy from you was testimonials, that you have actually delivered the impact you promised and that you got paid to do it, hit so home for me from all my communications work. And the reason, the reason is people don't want to be first. People do not want to be first. And in all my communications work, this goes, this happens over and over and over again as well. If you want your audiences to be excited about what you're talking about, you got to go first. You can't give it to me with a, with a, a flat pan delivery. If you want people to, um, have a particular reaction to or a particular commitment to the content that you're sharing on stage, whether it's a virtual stage or otherwise, you've got to go first. So if if folks who are listening to the show, you know, you're you're on the show because you've got some kind of goal, you've got some kind of impact you want to make, you've got some kind of mission you're on, and you know, you're you you can use, by the way, communications as a strike point for your leadership toward 
and in the face of that goal, that dream, that mission, that initiative that you're running. Don't just think about your communications moments as like, uh, or communications in general as a skill that you're building. Yes, it is a skill and used well, it makes a huge difference. But when you think of communications as a skill, it can get buried in, you know, how you, it can get stuck in your in your uh, text editors, right? It's just about, it can generalize across things and kind of lose the power that it really can have, which is as a strike point for your leadership and for your voice. And as you think about using communications as a strike point um, for your leadership and for your bo- voice, that means you're going to be recognizing the critical, the moments, the critical moments and the critical audiences that you're going to get to be in front of, whether it's three people in a, in a meeting or if it is a thousand people at an industry conference or in front of your board or in front of your um, potential investors or in front of your all hands or in front of et cetera, fill in the blank. And if you're thinking about If you're thinking about the kinds of things you want your audiences to do as an outcome of what you share with them, I want you to think about that piece of research. That people want testimonials. Why? Because they don't want to go, they don't want to be first. They don't want to take the risk of being first. So for you, as you go in front of your, in in front of the audiences that matter a lot to what you're trying to do, I want you to think about what does it mean for you to go first? Again, if you want them to be excited about what you're talking about, you need to be excited about it. If you want them to be engaged in what you're doing, you need to show up as engaged in what you're doing. If you want them to believe in your strategy, you've got to talk about it like you believe in the strategy. If you want them to see value in your work, you need to value your work. If you want your audiences to take your content, the story you're telling in front of them seriously and treat it as important, you need to take it seriously and treat it as important. We're not stepping into that moment apologetically. We're not stepping into that. Yes, you can be humble, but you don't have to be apologetic. <laughs> so as as um, I just love that piece of research that shows something that I've seen for so many years, that if you want to have an impact on others, you have to go first in demonstrating whatever the feeling, the idea, the enthusiasm it is that you want to be a contagion of, you have to be the contagion. So that's what was on my mind today. Hashtag contagion. Well, <laughs> it sounds crazy, but it's it is a little bit like you have to. So on our on my monthly newsletter recently, I shared a book that I read a handful of years ago called A General Theory of Love, and I will um, I will link it in the show notes for this episode. But the the core thing that I got from that um, from that book, which is not an easy read, but very compelling, is the sh- how how unbelievably contagious we are. How we are in a room gets on and in to other people. You can have a huge impact just with how you be with one another in a room. And so how you be with this, as you tell the story of the thing that is going to move your initiative, your dream, your goal forward, recognize you have a huge impact on what happens in that room. Your enthusiasm can be contagious or your, or your lack of enthusiasm, your lack of commitment, like commitment is also contagious. If you like the show, there are a lot of ways that you can support it. You can rate, review, or subscribe on your favorite podcast app, or you can share it on social media. Also, if you have a question for Dia, you can call us at 341-333-2997, and maybe you'll hear your question answered on a future episode. All right, so we have a great guest today. We do. We have Beth Sandifer. So let me tell you a little about Beth. Um, Beth is, she's a super seasoned event planner with a super strong background in, in development um, and hands-on experience in, with theatrical production. So she came from theater, I think. We're going to find out from her full story. Um, and when we say development, what we mean is fundraising, d- the development function that lives inside of the nonprofit world. Her efforts in general for her events um, – really focus on planning and execution of fundraising galas. Um, And typically, she works with really large um, auction components, and that's how I know her because I picked up my hobby of fundraising auctioneering for women-led nonprofits and nonprofits that benefit women and girls, and that's how I came across Beth Sandifer. So as a planner, she believes in working with clients um, to really find the inefficiencies and redundancies in their system so they can create a much more streamlined approach keeping the organizational mission always at the forefront. And that's true. She and I have worked on a couple of projects before, and she's always like, how does that fundraising, you know, support the mission? Let's focus 
on the mission all the time. But she still is really good at throwing a great party. She also works as a consultant and helps uh, integrate their annual fundraising event into year-round donor development for nonprofits through auction data collection and analysis. She's sort of a data nerd, as well as creating comprehensive sponsorship proposal strategies so that they can get their their larger, um, you know, business community community involved in what they do. Beth has built from the ground up Nobel Prize celebrations, multi-million dollar gala fundraisers, ribbon cutting, and the like. She's really interested in creating uniquely dramatic events without the drama. Okay, great. Oh my gosh, Beth, I'm so glad to have you. I know we talked about doing this a couple of weeks ago. We were both working on the create uh, the Creativity Explored fundraiser. That was a blast to do that. I was nervous to do that one. It was, yeah, it was, it was a little different, that one. Um, we were in a very tight space for that event, it w- but we made it I work. know. I feel like I did a good job though. I was, it was, pre- it was the first, it was the first and probably will be the only fundraiser I, or live auction I will, I will have done virtually. And that's a special kind of experience. Yes. Yes. So I'm, I'm um, invited you on because since Lodge, since launching Project Ask Like an Auctioneer, I've met a lot of folks who, in the middle of their careers, are thinking about starting a uh, a nonprofit. It's really, it's really interesting. I teach a class called Your Most Powerful Ask Live, and I ask folks in the chat, and we do it virtually because that's the only way that it's getting done these days. Um, I ask folks often to say, "What are one of your goals in the chat?" And surprisingly, so many folks say, "This is." the year for me to finally start that nonprofit that's tied to a particular initiative they really care about, you know, around autism or around, you know, helping women run for run for office or, you know, just a, a slew of um, of social impact and initi- social impact, you know, areas that are close to folks' hearts. So middle of the career seems like a time where a lot of that is happening for folks. And one of the things I've noticed since I started doing fundraising auctioneering as an impact hobby is how powerful and important a board is in, in your sustainability. And there's a gap between the potential a board can play um, the, the potential of, of the role that a board can play in fundraising over time through events or through your, you know, year over year, just sort of monthly giving and how boards actually get assembled and how, what they think their role can be. So I wanted to bring you on to talk about as a fundraising expert, you are yes in the event space, but also in the, around just fundraising in general, um, you know, annual giving as well as month over month giving sponsorships, you know, and you talk to and collaborate with a lot of EDs, executive directors of nonprofits and their boards. I wanted to have you come on and talk about if a woman is starting her own nonprofit, how does she put fundraising and how does she think strategically about fundraising w- from the outset? And then how does she think about crafting a board in support of that? Yes. <laughs> uh, that's all great. So yeah, I think that um, one thing that I think sometimes people don't realize when they're starting nonprofits or even just about nonprofits in general is that it's something like 70 to 80% of the funds that come in come from individual donors and not big institutional grants and corporate sponsorships and things like that. So there really is a lot of asking that needs to happen because you're having you know all of these individual gifts that are coming in. So I think that you need to be passionate about your cause. You need to be able to articulate what it is. Like, what are you raising money for? How much money is that going to take? And what is the timeline required for whatever project it is, whether it's starting a camp or building a playground or, you know, whatever it is, like, what is the timeline? People like that tangible thing. They like to understand that you have a plan of how you're going to accomplish this so that they feel confident. I can give my money to this person because there's a plan. This is how it's going to happen. So, and, and is, is that relevant both for donors, but also for board members you might invite to be on your board? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I think particularly for board members that when people, and I see this all the time, like with gala committees or someone, oh, join the gala committee. It's like, well, what does that mean? And you need to be able to say like, we're trying to raise like X number of dollars and this is how much we need you to raise. So any organization, as you're bringing on your board members, you should have goals for them. We need X number of dollars that we want to get from sponsorships and X number of dollars that we're getting from individual gifts and like how do so people can understand like well how do I fit into this because if you just have some 
you know, abstract lump sum greater good kind of thing you're going to do is someone might feel like, well, I can't contribute in a significant way to that because I'm not the kind of person that can bring, you know, a $25,000 donor to the table. But there are little other components. It's like, oh, but I can do that. I could host a house party and invite my friends, you know, to that party. So I like to have, um, I would encourage people to have like a give get form for board members that like, this is what we're asking each board member to be responsible responsible for in terms of the fundraising. And it's, you know, a table at the gala and a, a gift of a significant, you know, amount, you know, for your budget and like, you know, wine for this party and like what all those things are. And then have the understanding that like now me as a board member, it's my responsibility to I'm either buying the table at the gala or I'm getting enough of my friends together that I fill the table, but everyone's paid for their tickets individually, right? So like I don't have to be personally responsible for that money if I can get other people to chip in and and make that fundraising goal. And that can be, you know, especially as someone who's never been on a board before or is in an emerging, you know, role, whatever it is in their career. I mean, I'm in my mid 40s, like I'm definitely not in the position, even though I'm doing well, where I could buy a $5,000, you know, table or make that level of gift to an organization, but I got friends, you know, and I can yes. you know, bring them in. So just bring all of that stuff of like breaking it down into like very tangible goals that feel achievable, both for board members in terms of their participation and and then in terms of donors of like, this is what we are trying to achieve, people respond really well to that. It's interesting because I, I wonder if, you know, EDs or, you know, women who are looking at, you know, in the next 18 months, I'm going to, I'm going to create my new nonprofit and I'm going to put a, I'm going to put together a board that, you know, do you find that new EDs shy away from or it's intimidating? I can imagine it can be intimidating for them to be that clear and direct with their board, even though they might be wanting to bring influential folks in or folks who are really committed to the, to, to the same kind of work that, that that nonprofit is set out to do, that to be that clear that we don't just want your enthusiasm and your advice. <laughs> we, you know, we want you to take responsibility for a portion of helping us actually make this thing sustainable. Uh, our, our executive directors are afraid that's going to scare board members away. I think yes and no. I think a little bit has to do with just the personality of the ED. I think that, you know, to be a successful fundraiser, you have to, you can't be afraid of making an ask, right? You can't be afraid of hearing no, like you have to be willing to put yourself out there. You have to be willing to leverage your network and you need to surround yourself with people who are also willing to do all of those things. So I know, I mean, I know development directors that don't like making asks and I'm like, I don't understand how you have your job. That's all your job is. is asking, and for folks, you know. and for folks who are not in the, not in the nonprofit space or looking to enter it, who, what is a development director and what is their role? So development director is going to be with within the nonprofit, the person who is primarily responsible for the fundraising goals of the organization. Now you may have, you know, a executive director or a CEO, if it's an arts organization, you might also have an artistic director that they are going to play big roles and particularly the major asks, but sort of the day to day annual fund, you know, fundraising, your development director is really the one that's helping identify prospects, you know, writing the letters, having meetings with donors, they may have staff that works with them, but they're the like day to day core fundraising. And in the beginning of a nonprofit, I would imagine that if you are the ED and the founder of the nonprofit, you are also the development director. And what I'm hearing you say is before you go recruit a board, before you start imagining for yourself what the what the board might look like and who might be who might be on it, for you to actually write like a board job description with with you know here's what here's the type of folks we're looking for and also here's the commitment that they're making when they say yes to coming on as a board and and thinking through that before you even start approaching individuals so that you have a strong story about not just the who but the what the expectation is if they say yes to it yep absolutely I love that. And that, I mean, I can imagine that comes in some sort of strategic document or a, you know, a, 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 pay, a brochure of some sort that says like, hey, we're going to have a conversation about you coming on as, as a board member. Before we do, take a look at like what it means to be a board member with us. Yep. Yep. It's kind of a ball. It's kind of a baller and forward move, <laughs> but it seems really critical. I remember um, a few years ago, I did. Uh, I got to do the fundraising auctioneering for an organization in San Francisco dedicated to ending um, racism through digital storytelling and developing the next generation of diverse um, um, digital storytellers uh, and um, in folks in production and you know video making and movie making, etc. And um, I went to one of their board meetings. 
And the ED is like, I mean, she's no joke. She's not afraid to ask. She's like, go, 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 all of that. But she's also got, tw- and her development director is awesome, but they've got 12 board members. And I remember sitting in the room with them. And when I talked about, hey, I'm going to be in the room at the event to make the ask on behalf of this organization and its mission. But leading up to that, here's what you can do to make sure that that's successful. And I talked about recruiting their friends. I talked about getting sponsorships. I talked about how, you know, making asks and finding out if they can't ask for cash from their communities, maybe asking for a donation of their, you know, their kick-ass Tahoe cabin for a week as a live auction item, et cetera. Um, you know, s- you know, buying a batch of, t- of tickets to come to the gala. Um, those all, you know, pooling money to make a big give, whatever it might be. And I could see their eyes just sort of getting bit. And these folks were like senior executives at the brands that you all have in your computers and in your households right now. And so it can be intimidating even for your board mem- your board, to, to see themselves as accountable for that kind of thing, to go to their community and make those asks as well. What do folks do about that? Wow, well, gosh, that's a good question. I mean, I think that it's important to find people who are are passionate about your your cause, right? And and are willing to jump in. And, and again, I, you know, I mentioned it before the give get approach. That like, okay, maybe you don't do all this, but you help bring the people in. So you're helping meet this. So that can feel like it's taking some of you know the pressure off. And then I think that it's important once you get board members coming on to provide training for people. Like do Beautiful. retreats where you're talking about like your board should be able to at any minimum like recite your mission statement and at least be able to speak in broad terms about these are the programs that we have. They don't need to know all the minutia, but if you can sort of give them that, you know, kind of training and sort of background so they at least understand what you do. And you would be surprised how many board members do not know those things for organizations that they're on. And then, you know, in terms of like making asks, I mean, I remember back when I was still in-house in a nonprofit and we were doing a capital campaign, we had members of our board that had never made campaign asks before. And we set up role playing where we had board members asking other board members for their capital campaign gift. So it was that, okay, we're going to treat this as though this is a donor, you know, one of our non-board member donors, and you're going to make the ask, but because it's your fellow board member, like it's it's less pressure that way. And you at least get to try it out and, you know, see how it goes. So I think doing stuff like that. And so I think that as you're bringing board members on, if that's part of it too, like, yes, we have these requirements, you know, that we need people to meet, but this is also what we're, how we're going to support you and make you feel empowered and make you feel successful. Because honestly, at the end of the day, people give to other people. They don't give to causes. I mean, they do, you know, cancer, Alzheimer's, whatever. Like, yes, causes are important, but it's much more about the relationship between people to people. And major donors, any donors, they're going to respond more to my friend asked me to support this than they will to, oh, the staff member at Organization X asked me for this gift. And there's an at certain income thresholds, circles, whatever, there's kind of a quid pro quo thing of like, you know, Dia came to me today and said, you know, I'm really passionate about, you know, this art institute, you know, will you attend the gala and I attend the gala and I make a gift in the fund to need. And then I know that when I have, you know, my school auction, I'm going to be like, hey, Dia, like it was so I had so much fun with you at that art institute gala, like you should come be at my table at my school gala. And D is going to do it, right? There's that, like, I'm going to give to your organization, you're going to give to mine. So I think that letting, making sure board members know that, like, that is a natural relationship to have with your network. It also makes it less scary to be like, you're not just asking for money, hoping for the goodness of their heart and whatever. Like, there's an understanding of a reciprocal relationship. I think that's important for board members to understand. That's fantastic. I love, um, it seems like there's a theme here, too, of, like, don't underestimate or don't overestimate the confidence your boards might have in going out and making the ask. And this this idea of in your little briefing document that you might share with potential board members, you know, what their response, when they're saying yes to being on the board, what they're also saying yes to in terms of fundraising or tapping their network for all kinds of the aspects that go into the fundraising, but also, you know, what you're going to do to help them be successful is super smart so that it, so that that, 
they feel enabled. And also, they're going to get some professional development out of it, to, to be honest. I mean, we, we have to make asks and approaching our community to get, you know, to get more of what we need to reach our goals spans not just, you know, the work we do in this, the area of fundraising, but, you know, lots of places in our lives. So it, it can be really confidence building if you give folks the tools to actually be able to action the potential of their own networks to fund the things that really matter. So, um, how did you end up in fundraising? <laughs> um, I mean, I come from a performing arts background. I worked in theater companies. Um, and at some point, I founded a theater company on a base in Germany where I was run. I had been, I was an actor and a singer <laughs> and then started a theater company when I was living in Germany and, you know, got into the administrative side of the arts. And then when I moved back to the States, I was just working in various theater companies in marketing and development and fundraising positions. And um, after moving to California, I was running a lot of the events at the theater that I was at. And I just got to a point where I was like, I feel like I've done everything I can do here. If all I did was plan our gala all year long, I would be happy. So I started my own event planning company. And in the beginning, I was like, oh, I can do corporate events and I can do weddings and I like I can do it all. And sure, I can. But then there are three very different segments of the event market. And fundraising is just it's what I know. I think that th in terms of fundraising events, you have to be able to throw a good party that people want to attend and want to come back to, but you have to do it in a way that you're still telling the story of the organization and keeping that mission forefront within the excellent party that people are attending. Um, and it's just a very specific skill set that I have. And so it, like, it's a very, you know, sort of niche market. And particularly when you start getting into fundraising auctions, I love an auction and I get obsessed with the data that you can collect around bitter behavior and how does that inform your strategy and because I was once not only throwing the annual events at my last theater company, but also doing their annual fund management, I like to think about how does everything that happens at the gala translate into the fundraising that we're doing all year long. And it's I've just sort of settled into this very specific niche of, you know, fundraising events, but I, I love it. What are some of the data trends or, or bitter behaviors? And when we say bitter for folks who are listening, we mean in a in a live auction, maybe also in a silent auction when folks are raising their paddles and saying, yes, I'll pay for that at this level and competing for the winning bid. Now, whether it's virtual or live, I don't know how the data, you know, what the data shows you in terms of data, you know, um, bitter behavior. But what are some of the th interesting insights about bitter behavior that might be surprising to us? I mean, people are motivated to give by different, re by, you know, different reasons motivate people to give. So I, for example, at my last theater had one of our most major donors, like one of our top four donors, she never gave to the annual fund. She only like bid large in the auction because she wanted to be raising her paddle in that room where everyone could see, you know, that she was, you know, doing it. So when I think about bidders, I, I tend to break it down into sort of three categories that you have your bidders who are just there to shop in the auction. They want stuff in exchange for their money. You have the pledgers who are people that are maybe not shopping so much in the auction, but they're giving to your paddle raise or your fund to need or special appeal, whatever you're calling it. And then you have like your super supporters who are doing both, you know, and you will know who those people are before you ever walk in the room. Like they'll have bought the table. They're giving big in the special appeal. They're giving, you know, big in the, in the shopping, big in the auction. Like there's kind of those, you know, you know, three tiers. And I actually did some work um, with my theater company where we were talking about raising ticket prices and we were trying to figure out what percentage of like, what percentage could we raise each ticket price? And we had like a gold, silver, bronze sort of ticket structure. Gold obviously were the super supporters. People assumed that like, oh, well, there are silver ticket buyers. Like they're kind of awesome. They're like mini sort of super supporters. But when we looked at the data, the silver supporters, they were buying that ticket level so they could get their name on the invitation. And then maybe they'd buy a raffle ticket or make a small gift in the in the paddle raise, but like they weren't really doing much. And it was the bronze ticket buyers, like the cheap tickets that were actually spending a ton of money in the auction and were super active in the auction. So it was like, oh, okay, well then I'm then percentage wise, the silver tickets are going to get a larger percentage bump because they're just going to go with it because they want their name on the invitation. And my bronze ticket buyers might go like, that's where my auction, you know, sort of traffic is. So it sort of also flipped that paradigm of thinking that like, oh, these are our cheap ticket buyers. So it's like, no, those are your auction bidders. You know, they're just buying it. Maybe it's the lower price, so they have more money to spend in the auction. You know, who knows? But um, you can't just assume that the people that are buying the most 
expensive tickets are the ones that are then also bidding the most in the auction. I think that's one of the most interesting things I've seen. Very, very interesting. Since I picked up this impact hobby, I um, have seen and heard conversations from fundraising professionals like you and from EDs that as um, fundraiser events have moved away, um, have moved more strongly toward only a direct pledge. And for folks who are new to this, a direct pledge or a fund in need or a paddle raise is a moment in, in a fundraising experience where you literally from stage just say, we're now taking direct donations. And people put their they they bid either with a, a bidding tool on a on a mobile device or they put their paddle in the air and they're just making a direct pledge in exchange for nothing else other than you know whatever they get internally for themselves when they make that pledge whether it's about relationship or the altruism of the event or you know or the the cause the cause itself so um um I have heard a handful of folks say that they have actually done better at their fundraising events without actually having to put together a live auction for items in exchange for money, but the direct they they've been able to raise equal amounts year over year and even beat their fundraising goals with only a direct pledge. Is that true? Have you, are you seeing that as well? And why do you think that is? I think it depends on the organization. I mean, honestly, I did an auction. Of, I did a virtual event last night that had both an auction and a paddle raise. And I've seen their live auction just declining over the years. They're not getting great. They used to get great items. They're not getting as great items. Like they don't have a lot of bitter engagement. And it's something that I think for them, I would want to suggest of like, what if we give the auction a rest for a few years and just do like focus all your attention and energy on your fund to need and just try to get in the funds and like not do the auction you know but then I have other auctions where I mean they're raising hundreds of thousands of dollars and it's like okay well it's working like don't take it away so there tends to be a life cycle to donors there's about a seven year life cycle that someone's going to be really the average donor is going to be really active with your organization that applies both to auction items you know things get stale you have to mix them up um you know again, the, the sort of shopper versus pledger, you know, kind of mentality. Like I think if you're going to have an auction in your event every year, you just need to keep making it fresh. I have an auctioneer friend, co- colleague we both have in common who likes to say five new bidders, five new items every year um, to sort of keep things fresh. And I think some organizations, and this is a trap that I think you can fall into, like I have my board, I have my auction items, I have my things, like I'm set. But if you're not constantly infusing new energy into that and understanding that after X number of years, something's going to be stale, someone's going to have life changes and not be as invested, like you have to constantly be feeding your pipeline. And so I think where I feel like I see auctions suffer over years is when people aren't feeding the pipeline to keep it fresh. So for folks who might be listening to this show and thinking about, you know, in the next 18 months is the year I'm going to start my nonprofit and I'm going to host maybe my very first fundraising event. Um, I mean, I want to ask the question, like, what should they be considering? But I want to start with, um, is it okay to have a first year where you don't hustle a bunch of um, items or consign items for uh, auction, but instead experiment with just a direct pledge moment? Or do you want at your first fundraising event to have a mix of things so you can see what performs best? I think it's absolutely okay to not have an auction in your first, whatever your first fundraising event. I think you should always have that cash appeal. You know, the fund and need paddle raise like that. You should always be asking for straight donations. Um, Maybe your first year, something like a raffle or a wine bin, you know, kind of thing isn't easy. But I don't think you should feel the pressure of, oh, we have to have all these silent auction items and a live auction items unless you have the network to put it together. Like if you've got those resources, great, put it together. If you don't, then don't focus. I would rather see people focusing on the fund to need and just getting in those donations and having an event, you know, particularly a first time event, like just building the audience for it and building the brand around the event and getting people into like, oh, the our event is the third Saturday, you know, or of every March, you know, like that kind of thing. And like start folding in the auction when you have a network, you know, and the resources to have really great auction items. So if you have your first fundraising in for your brand new, uh, your brand new nonprofit that you've been dreaming about for the last decade, and and you're going to decide to go with a fund a need only or a paddle raise or a direct pledge, whatever we're calling it, it's a moment in the event where you ask for people to just simply give you money. What are some of the best practices around around making that ask? 
Um, a few things. Um, again, having tangible goals, you know, we're trying to raise X number of dollars, you know, for this project or whatever, um, being able to break down so that people understand what their money does. And you don't always have to be like, oh, well, $10,000 buys this many books and $5,000 funds this many students for this program or whatever it is. Like some, you can, if you have that kind of stats, you can weave them in. That's great. Some people will respond to that. Other people will respond to the story of, you know, Ashley, who came to juvenile arthritis camp and was able to, you know, interact with other kids who also had juvenile arthritis for the first time. And like, this is how her life was changed. You know, it's more the impact. Like we do work that impacts kids like Ashley, right? Like that kind of thing. So there's kind of, and there's, that's a six of one, half a dozen of the other kind of approach. Like they both work equally. It's just a different approach. But I think that, um, not just for this kind of moment, but for really any fundraising that you're doing, it's still pretty old school. Like the old school stuff still applies. So much about fundraising is relationships and cultivating those relationships. And, you know, you can't just have an event or have an online campaign and like hope that people will come. Like you need to be having conversations with people, you know, getting on the phone and, you know, this is important to us and we hope that you're able to participate and, you know, can we count on you for a gift and like having all of those face to face on the phone, you know, however people are communicating, but like actual conversations with people, getting them to buy in to the concept of what you're doing and like throwing their support behind you. I love what you pointed out that, you know, in the pre-work, you know, can we count on you for X is about having a few key folks or, or, you know, maybe they're big, big donors, maybe they're coming in at the middle tier where whatever that means for your organization, but for them to be able to commit verbally to something before they even show up, then the making the ask is a lot about the ritual of doing a collective give, which can make folks in the room, your donors feel part of something, which has value to them, you know, to make a public show of support and be celebrated by the people around them. And to be part of a collective give is a very fulfilling experience for folks. So, I mean, having made the asks on behalf of nonprofit organizations that that I've been, you know, engaged with for my impact hobby, that that is material in the room. I get brought to tears all the time at different events when I'm seeing, you know, paddles going up and the tally being raised and, you know, people really rallying around whatever, like all the time, you know, and you'd think, I mean, I do like 50 events a year. So you would think it would be old hat to me at this point, but I still have those moments where I'm just like, it's so great, you know, to see people really like together in that moment, you know, supporting whatever organization it is. So I heard that the two best practices when you're in the room, well, there are three maybe that I'm just going to name out loud that I heard you say that seem like they're standouts to me. One is to secure the bag before people even walk in the room as much as you possibly can. So that the the ask in the room around that paddle raise moment is really just, it's just the, the actioning of a decision that's already been made. Two is that you can use um, storytelling as a setup for the ask. Your example of Ashley is really beautiful. And if you have an opportunity to even, especially for a new nonprofit that maybe hasn't even, you know, the, the, I would say that the the um, like you haven't done anything yet. <laughs> the, yeah, you're at the beginning of the journey, but finding those those parallel experiences that reflect the kind of impact that you're going to be having or adding to um, can be a really great way to set up and make concrete the what the money in the room is going to make possible. And then third, I heard you say get really clear with and, and have a plan for saying out loud to the room as you make the ask in between making asks at different levels or as you set up the ask um, to make it clear what the money actually does. You know, tonight, if it's a fund and need, maybe it's, you know, tonight we are, uh, we are funding um, a particular program that we're launching this year that costs $125,000. Here's what, you know, all of the people who are served by this program get. So people can, people can see something concrete and tie their donation to an actual thing that's happening in the world all the way down to saying, you know, $100 funds, you know, a family uh, getting delivered meals, you know, 10 times a month. And we want to support, you know, 250 families this year, for example. Yep. Beth, this has been super helpful. And for those of you listening and are dreaming about starting uh, your nonprofit and and you recognize that fundraising is an integral part in you being able to 
really fulfill your impact dream with the resources required to do that. Um, and, you know, you see that you, I hope you, we hope you got something meaningful and a place to start um, and a few frameworks and mental frameworks that you can use um, while you engage a, a board that's going to be meaningful in your um in your journey, and also uh, a few fundraising strategies as you think about, you know, hosting your very first event. Beth, thank you so much for being with us. How can people find you and what can they do with you? (laughs) Um, Well, thank you for having me. It's been fun. Um, I'm at Beth Sandifer pretty much everywhere. I'm on Instagram. Um, I, my website is just bethsandifer.com, which I assume might get posted in some show notes or something like that. It it Um, will. (laughs) um, So, I mean, I'm, you know, primarily, uh, you know, and I build myself as a fundraising strategist. So definitely event production, but I work exclusively with nonprofits on fundraising events. So if you're thinking about having a fundraising event and you need an event planner, great, you should call me. But just know that I also like to dig into the strategy and ROI of how you're coming up with your auction procurement strategy. I work with clients on coming up with like revamping sponsor benefit structure, and there's sort of different ways to do it. And, um, you know, I've got job descriptions and board training, you know, materials and that sort of thing. I like I work a lot with boards and having, you know, launch meetings and, you know, facilitating all of their their stuff as we're going along so everyone understands their role. So it's um, because I come from that nonprofit fundraising background, I never think of an event as a single day event. To me, it's like, how does this piece play into the larger whole and, and really come at my event planning practice with that in mind? All right, so that was great. Yeah, very interesting. I just it's uh, it's surprising to me how many folks I'm meeting in the middle of their careers who are, you know, wanting to start nonprofits and it's 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 important to wait, you know, to, or to recognize the interdependence um, between, you know, fundraising, your ability to fundraise and your ability to actually fulfill your mission. Period. So having Beth on today was perfect. I I hope everyone got a place to start. What stood out for you? You don't you don't live you don't live in and around the the nonprofit world much, but is there anything that stood out for you? No, you know I've always been a person that's donated money to causes, but I haven't really. I've never been to a charity auction. I've never been to a gala that I can think of. <laughs> but um, the the stuff about the different tiers of ticket holders that she was talking about was kind of interesting. That like you would think the bronze people are just they're maybe they're just to to go right, and, cheap and, seats. They're the cheap seats. The, yeah, but that they were the ones in this particular organization that were bidding on the auction items. Spenders, and actual the spenders. High and the high ticket people weren't. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. Super interesting. Just from like a sociological perspective. Yeah. I think it's just, you never know what you're going to get. And I guess that's the power also of, you know, of data. And it's always been interesting to me that Beth, when I first met her, she was like, I'm super into the data. And I was like, what does that mean? And, and a perfect example of how you can use data to, to make some really strategic decisions and notice like where your money is actually coming from. You would think that that kind of super um, micro data analysis would have been part of the nonprofit game for a long time, but it seems like it's not. I think it's not. I also thought it was an interesting point that she said, you know, the the old school stuff still applies. You still got to call the people that are your supporters. You still have to reach out. And it's very, you know, it's a slog to confirm those few people. Now, in the time that I, who, who, you know, can we count on you for a $1,000 donation? Can we count on you for $5,000? In some of the events that I got to do when I started um, auctioneering for, you know, as a, as a hobby, like, you know, one of the most critical things that the development director and the ED and the board did was to confirm the largest donations, um, at least one. So if we knew that the, the highest, maybe we were going to be starting at a, you know, at a $25,000 donation for the, for the fund and need, and then work our way down, down and make asks that were less and less and less until we got to a hundred dollars or whatever, you know, to know that we had 25, that first, that 20, that one $25,000 give secured before we walked in the room made a huge difference in how confident the event felt for people and how, how much it just sort of ignited the rest of the giving. So yeah, that pre-work, that old school, call your friends, you know, have them make a promise. Right. 
Well, thanks, baby, for being with me here today. And I wanted to say that, you know, we started this episode talking about, you know, going first. And um, if you go to diabondi.com, you're going to find something called the 21, which are the 21 most, you know, strategic, direct, and actionable strategies you can use when you get in front of audiences that matter to your goals. The 21 things you can do to have more impact in that moment. And the first thing you can do is go first. Um, so go to diabondi.com and you can find that um, find that tool right there on uh, on the website. Great. You know, I thought you were going to say we started the episode talking about my purple pants. I mean, I cannot guarantee that there is an opt-in to get yourself a pair of purple pants, but um, maybe we can do an opt-in to get a picture of Baby A in his purple pants. Yeah, I can try to find a picture maybe that uh, that that uh, we can put in the show notes. I love it. You and your purple okay. pants. Bye, everybody. Bye. The Dia Bondi Show is a production of Dia Bondi Communications and is produced by Baby A. Please like, share, rate, and subscribe at Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your favorite podcast. Do you have a question for Dia about an important ask in your life? Give us a call at 341-333-2997 and maybe you'll hear your question answered on a future episode.